It's time for us to turn our attention to tennis. Colin Buig is with us. Colin, the way we Morning, do this Jeff. is we've got a 15 love slot, a 30 love slot, a, a 40 love slot and a game set and championship point, turns out, uh, this weekend, this Monday. How are you, Colin? Not too bad yourself, sir. Are you reeling after Novak Djokovic's latest success? Yeah, I, heard, I am. I heard you earlier. I'm sick. I heard you earlier. I thought it was harsh. I thought it was harsh. I heard you at the very top of the show this morning saying, was it sometimes evil triumphs? Yeah. I mean, come on. Like, whatever you think of Djokovic, sir, and I actually I know well what you think of him, but whatever people think of him in general, like, the statistics don't lie for Djokovic's latest achievement. That's, he's the first player since Rod Laver in 1969 to win all four Grand Slams at least twice. He's the first player in 72 years to recover from two sets down twice at the same Grand Slam and win it. And of course, he's on course now for a Golden Grand Slam. He's never recovered from two sets down in any of his 29 previous Grand Slam finals. And most importantly, lads, he's on 19 Grand Slams now, which is just one behind Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer, which means Wimbledon, which starts in two weeks' time, is going to be very exciting. By the um, And what I'm sorry, what I'm very interested to see if he does go and win Wimbledon, which he's by far the favourite to do, I wonder will Federer and Nadal tweet him congratulations, just like Federer tweeted Nadal congratulations last October when Nadal equaled his 20 hall. Well, I'm sure their media teams will, will definitely send out the required response. So what you're telling me is Novak Djokovic is on the verge of becoming the new Margaret Court. <laughs> oh, uh, statistically, sick. yes. Statistically, yeah. If you just look at his CV for trophies... And I won't comment any further on what you've been there. But he is on course to become the greatest. And I, we had actually the three of us... What a, what, a, what a great tournament or champion's breakfast that would be, whatever it is. The, the dance that they have uh, after, after Wimbledon where they all show up and dance together. Margaret Court and Novak Djokovic together at last. <laughs> the three of us had this debate the morning after the French Open final last year. It was out of the big three who was going to be the greatest. And... Uh, you could easily vouch for all three in different ways. Easily, all three. I mean, Federer, you could say, is the most naturally talented. Nadal is the most dominant of any single discipline in, in any sports person in history. Maybe Floyd Mayweather's defensive game in boxing, I don't know. Possibly there are other examples, but Nadal and, and, French, and French Open clay, up until Friday night, you would say, oh, it's a sure thing. And then Djokovic is just the best all-rounder, which is the stat I started with that he's won all four Grand Slams at least twice. So there are arguments for all of them, and we're in this um, brilliant era that we'll probably never get again. I mean, you could say, one argument you would definitely make is that the three best players of all time are playing at the same time. Con Conor, you, just, you, you described Novak Djokovic there as the best all-rounder, which says to me that he is the best at tennis, which says to me that he is the greatest of all time. And can we not just get to that point of accepting that sometimes the bad guy is the best? I get why people prefer Nadal and Federer because they are less of a dickhead than Novak Djokovic is. I get that. But we do have to separate the, what, yeah. the, the, the man from the achievement. And this guy will, more than likely call him, surpass the 20. He won't just reach the 20. He'll probably surpass the 20. He will, he will go above the two boys having had to break that duopoly that existed in the sport to come in and break up the Nadal and Federer control on the sport and then to overtake them. He, like, I, I just can't see a world in which you can make an argument against that being the greatest of all time if he surpasses them, which I think will happen. So this sort of thing of, is he the best all-rounder of all time? Is that just a cop-out? Is that just a way of not whoa, saying whoa, he's the best ever? Whoa. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm qualifying all three. I mean, yeah, you're right. First of all, you have to separate the man from the art. But, I mean, what Who has Who really cares about that? the Australian Open anyway, Owen? Like, come what? on. What? And that's what? the thing. Like, it was never, cares about the Australian it was never Open. really considered the, on a par with Jeez. the other three. They invented this Shouting fourth one it. for, like, come on. What, um, I mean, come on, lads. I mean, what's he really done that that's bad? Okay, his anti-vaccination stance, the US Open incident last year. He's definitely the least likable out of the three. Having but a I party was, in the middle of uh, organising yeah, yeah. a, a yeah, super no, spreader yeah. event. What a party it was. Totally. Totally, but I mean, in the grand scheme of evil famous people, he's way down the list. Yeah. I mean, um, and, and also, like, I had this debate with, I think, Adrian Barry. Uh, <laughs> that's not a great, that's like, that's not really <laughs> a great, the, the middle that's of not last quite week, the winning right? argument you think hold it on is, there, Colin. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> I had a debate with Adrian in the middle of last week, and I was saying, uh, because Djokovic went mental after his quarterfinal win against M Matteo Berrettini, and he was shouting at his box, just unhinged. And I was saying to Adrian, why doesn't he just embrace this side of his personality? Why doesn't he play the bad guy? 
why doesn't he play in wrestling terms the heel? Because you are not going to surpass Nadal and Federer in terms of loves. You never will. And there's an argument to say that Djokovic really wants to be loved. Now, by all accounts, he's quite a popular dressing room player, but it doesn't transcend to the to the public opinion of him, especially in the last year or two, which, you know, his PR has just been a nightmare. Because up until that point, he was just the least favourite out of the three, but now he's giving people reasons to dislike him actively. Um, I don't mind it so much. I don't really care about any of the bad things he's done that much because I just love watching him play. Um, and that that semi-final against Nadal on Friday night, I mean, Sunday's final against Tsitsipas, Stefano Tsitsipas, was brilliant as well. I mean, Tsitsipas raced into a two-set lead and he actually revealed afterwards on Instagram that he found out five minutes before he took the Philip Chatteret that his grandmother had passed away. His um, his father's mother, who was his coach, who was in the stand as well. So for him to to go out and perform like that in the first two sets, and especially the second set where he blew Djokovic away, uh, was incredibly admirable. But Djokovic took a break, went back, came back out, changed clothes, and was just a different player, just like he was in the fourth round against L- L- uh, Lorenzo Mazzetti when he was two sets down and went and got changed and came back a different player. But the thing with Djokovic is he's not afraid of five sets. He's not afraid of going the distance. No. And that's the most intimidating no. aspect. His, play against them. his physical prowess is really very impressive. So that's uh, our 15 love point is Djokovic creates history twice in one match to win his 19th Grand Slam. What was the what was the second bit of history? Come, that was the first time he's come from two sets down, or what was? Yeah, the... yeah, no, I, I was naming the history at the start there, which is the big the big two stats, the Rod Laver comparison. I mean, the four Grand Slams twice, right, uh, is incredible, and also the the fact that he's come from two sets down. Yeah, the first pair to come from two sets down twice in the same Grand Slam. Because he looked very that. tired in the first two sets and then he didn't look tired in the rest of the game. Yeah, but he, he does, he's done that so many times. He did it against Mazzetti. I mean, he um, he was tired against Nadal and he beat him in four sets. You know, he just has this knack of, uh, of performing when it really matters and he can be up against it and he has confidence in his own body and his own talent that uh, when he's in a losing position, he doesn't panic. He does not panic. And he had Nadal panicking at the French Open, probably for the first time. I mean, you have to realize, I mean, Nadal's record at the French Open, I know you can only lose once every year, so the idea that he's only lost three times, you know, it's a caveat, because you can only lose once. Well, but yeah. since he made his debut in 2005, like he lost to Robin Soderling in 2009 in the fourth round, and Soderling went to the final and lost to Federer. He lost to Djokovic in 2015 in the quarterfinal, and Djokovic lost that final to Stan Wawrinka. The following year, Djokovic won the French Open when Nadal pulled out in the early round, rounds through injury, uh, Djokovic beat Andy Murray in that final. So this was really the first time where a top, uh, not, not, not quite 100% Nadal, but an extremely good Nadal was beaten by the better man. Because in 2015, Nadal was way out of form. He had completely lost his confidence. And in 2009, he was basically a child. And Soderling beat him in a one-off. But Djokovic against Nadal, it was up there. I, I was tweeting about it. I think everybody was. That it was up there with the 2008 Wimbledon final between Federer and Nadal in terms of watching two greats playing great at the same time. And I know it, it was coinciding with the first Euros game, but, you know, according to Twitter and my WhatsApp, you know, just popping like little secret texts all over the place saying, this is just remarkable. This is monumental stuff. And the thing about tennis, I would always say to people is you'll get this five match every four or five years where even if you have no interest in the sport, it's so compelling to watch two players like that go at it because you don't know what's going to happen. That third set on Friday night is, is Hall of Fame territory. It's marked off already. OK, so your prediction is that Djokovic is going to end up with the most Grand Slams? Oh, you just do the maths. I mean, he's the youngest. He's 34 to Nadal's 35. Federer's 40 in August. If he won another one, he'd be doing very well. Djokovic is, every year, is the favourite for three of the four slams. And now he just beat the best at the other stand that he's not favourite for. Yeah. So if you do the maths, he's, he, he could easily surpass Nadal and Federer. It doesn't mean that he's the best ever for everybody. I mean, I have my own opinion. Some, like, other people have their others. As I say, all three you can make you can make a serious case for, and you wouldn't be wrong. You wouldn't be wrong with picking any of the three. Except um, Chocolate, obviously. And I then uh, really right our, our match point today is the, uh, the women's winner, the correct pronunciation of her surname? Uh, Krachikova. Krachikova. Krachikova, yeah. Unbelievable, lads. I was... Um, I was, I was writing about it over the weekend for otbsports.com. This, you know, her CV, 25 years of age, a complete unknown. This is only her fifth ever Grand Slam singles entry. She's never played Wimbledon singles. She probably will in two weeks' time. And she wins the French Open uh, with a really good performance against Anastasia Pavlyuchenko on Saturday. 
But not just that, she's also a three-time Grand Slam doubles winner and a three-time Grand Slam mixed doubles winner. In fact, she won on Sunday in the doubles. Uh, and with that, becomes the first player since Mary Pierce in 2000 to win the singles and doubles in the same year at Roland Garris. She's a remarkable person, uh, was coached by the late great Yana Novotna, the 1998 Wimbledon champion. Um, she realised, uh, as an 18-year-old critique of her, that Novata lived in the town beside her in the Czech Republic. So she and her parents called to Novotna's house, armed with a letter that Kritikova wrote asking for Novotna for advice on how to make the most of a burgeoning tennis career. And Novotna said, let's, let's rally, let's hit a few shots, see what you're like. And uh, Novotna said, yeah, we'll take it from there. And she coached her for a few years. And of course, Novotna, Novotna very sadly passed away from cancer in late 2017. And uh, one of the last things she said to Kritikova was, you know, try to enjoy tennis. And if you can, win a Grand Slam. And then less than a year later, she won the French Open doubles and Wimbledon doubles. And then three years later, she's won the French Open singles. And now she's won the same amount of Grand Slam singles championships as her great here in Novotna. It's a remarkable story. And barely anybody knows her, which is mad. It good enough with the, in terms of the quality of her game to win at Wimbledon and the US Open, is it, or is it a clay court game exclusively, do you think? Clay court, really. I mean, she, it's her perfect surface. As I said, she's never played Wimbledon singles before, ever. So who knows what's going to happen in a couple of weeks. You would imagine that she's uh, the adrenaline will finally wear off now after that remarkable achievement over the weekend. Um, like she only won her very first singles title in the warm-up event before Roland Garros. She won the Strasbourg Open the day before the French Open started this year and not an eyelid was batted, you know. Yeah. Nobody knew who this person was. So, it, you know, whatever she does now, it's still a great achievement. But she's only 25 and uh, she's not afraid by the fact that she is not that well known. So it, it could serve her well. All right, you know? Colm, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers, lads.